be really, really tuned in to your pupil and go where they want to go, do what they want to do, keep their courage and their motivation up, but then just gently be aware of what they're not doing and from time to time slip it in. So if they are only comfortable reading from notation, from time to time slip in a little improvisation in the key of the piece they're playing. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Good day, everyone. Welcome back to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to episode 110, and if you're one of my inner circle piano teaching community members, a very special welcome to you. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show, and if this is your first time here, thank you so much for tuning in. This is the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, business, and teaching strategies to help support your own teaching and grow your studio. Today's show notes and a full tr- transcript are available as usual from timtopham.com slash episode 110. This episode of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly sponsored by the Casio Selviano Grand Hybrid Piano, which I've had the pleasure of reviewing and testing over the last few months. To create their entry into the hybrid piano market, Casio collaborated with C. Beckstein in Germany. And with Casio's strength in digital technology, combined with C. Beckstein's understanding of acoustic piano design, the Silviano is one of the first truly affordable hybrid pianos. Um, interestingly, using it in my studio has been great because I've been getting my students to try playing it and move to an acoustic piano and keep mixing it up. And a number of them will continually go back to the Silviano. They really enjoy how it feels and also how it sounds. Some of the things that I really like about the Selviano, obviously the touch is truly authentic to a grand piano style. They have full full length keys, full grand piano action, uh, and even all the hammers, of course, they don't have felt on them because there's no strings, but they're all weighted individually, uh, and it is a truly remarkable playing experience. I'm very, very impressed by it, and more so by the price point. With models starting around $5,000, this is actually uh, an entry level but incredibly Um, responsive and uh, authentic piano. So if you're interested to find out more, you can visit soundtechnology.com.au for information and there's a where to buy link there as well. So last week on the podcast, we were talking about playing pop songs by ear in particular, and I gave you a great demonstration about how I do that actually at the piano with an example song from a student. That's episode 109 if you missed it. Today, we've got a special guest expert uh, in helping teachers gain confidence, more confidence on this topic and understanding the importance of helping students play by ear and improvise in a more general kind of sense. My guest today is a pianist, psychologist, and internationally renowned pedagogue who helps teachers understand how to help students play spontaneously without books and say yes when asked to play Happy Birthday. She has developed a wealth of immediately accessible and musically satisfying ideas around playing by ear, which are published by Faber Music in a book called Piano by Ear, and on informants in a series of video clips with supporting text, and it's called Anyone Can Improvise. We'll give you more information about that later on. She's director of the UK's leading piano teachers course, and also runs a week-long summer course in the UK for teachers to inspire and refresh music teaching and performing. Welcome to the show, Lucinda Mackworth-Young. Thank you, Tim. What a wonderful introduction. And it's a great honor to be on your show. Well, we've been trying to make it happen for some time now. And so I'm really honored that you're able to spend some time with me today. And I know that our listeners are going to get lots out of it. I actually was incredibly surprised by your your, all your post nominals. I couldn't believe you had two LCTLs uh, in both clarinet and piano. Plus, you've got your MA in the psychology of education, and you've got a whole lot of things that I don't actually know what, <laughs> what they are, um, including a certification, a certification in soul therapy and a registration as a healer. And I was just wondering, what, what are those last two all about? Well, they're not necessarily musically related, although many people, many musicians are, are very sensitive to all kinds of subtle energy. I'm a great believer in intuition, and I'm sure many, many of us teach using intuition. It's all very well to have a lesson plan, and it's a good idea to have your mind around all the possibilities that you can do with your student. But when your student is there, you need to tune in using all your senses and do exactly what's right to keep your 
pupils or your students motivation and enthusiasm and ability the feelings of ability the courage of feelings for ability high so i mean really we're all um psychologists aren't we tim and and <laughs> we have and to be don't we we're, we're all into these we're all into these subtle energies yes. and i just have had the luck um to have had more training in them Oh, it's brilliant. And I can only imagine how that combines uh, together with your knowledge of psychology and obviously your expert teaching in music to combine to provide an incredibly holistic approach, which we see through your books and through your videos online too. I also hear you're a dancer. I am. <laughs> I <guess. laughs> do you still get much time to do that? Um, a little. I teach, dance, uh, teach musicians um, the dances that they'll play um, mazurka, minuet, land, like gavotte, really? gallop, um, waltz. Yeah, it's, it's good fun. Um, oh, wow. uh, and with uh, my colleague Nicola Gaines, we founded ages ago an association called Music, Mind and Movement. And she is a dance specialist and a dance teacher. And we have been sharing information and ideas and giving workshops for, for uh, 30, 30, 40 years. Wow. Wow. Oh, I can only imagine how much more uh, a student would understand a minuet if they get the chance to dance it. That's just one example, of course. It's good fun. It's good fun. Now, before we get into the playing by ear, I know you did your master's in pupil-centered learning and that importance from moving our thinking from the teacher sort of directs everything and the pupil sits there and does it to a much more shared experience, which is obviously at the heart of my own teaching and what I recommend teachers do. How, how has that approach changed your own teaching or were you already teaching in that more shared way before? Um, oh, yes, I was. Um, so I did a, a master's degree in the psychology of education, knowing that I needed to have proper initials and um, a proper degree for people to take what I was doing seriously. And as part of the MA, I did some research into my own pupils, comparing and contrasting pupil-directed and teacher-directed lessons. At that stage, I had the idea that if you let the pupil direct, um, they would have enormous fun and it would all be great. But of course, that wasn't quite the way. Right. So, Lucinda, what sparked your interest in helping students play by ear? Um, because I was such a dunce at it myself. I was conventionally <laughs> trained, went through all, all our eight grades, and to my mortification, discovered that despite getting the eighth grade with distinction in two instruments, I could not, at my grandfather's birthday party, just sit at the piano and play happy birthday. And I was aware that other, other people, other teenagers about my age, who'd never had a formal lesson in their lives, could sit down at the piano and busk a pop song. And I was just angry. This was wrong. Why should I, who'd diligently been conventionally trained, be suffering? Mm. And so it, 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 really, it really set me thinking. And for many years, I thought that someone who could play by ear and improvise really should write a book for the rest of us to learn how to do it. But that didn't happen. And then as I taught, as I taught, and I loved my teaching, um, realizing that things go very logically and progressively, step by step, that you have to build one skill on another, that first of all, they learn to read mid C, and then they learn to read D and so on, that we could do this exactly the same with playing by ear, that first of all, you learn to distinguish two, two notes from each other, then three notes, then four notes, then five notes. First of all, you learn to distinguish two chords from each other, then three chords, then four chords, and so on. And so years and years later, me, the one who couldn't do it at all, found myself writing a book, a really, really step-by-step -step book so that everyone could do it. Right. Okay. And it makes it makes perfect sense. And I know lots of people who are listening are going to be thinking, yep, they're nodding their head, he's saying exactly the same thing. Why is it that this is such an aspect of teaching that is so often neglected uh, today, but also by our teachers and our teachers' teachers? Yeah. Well, overwhelmingly, of course, we teach what we know. We teach what we're comfortable with. And so many teachers will still go, oh, no, I like the idea of teaching to play by ear. And I like the idea of teaching to improvise, but I haven't a clue how to start. And if we go back to the very, very olden days, people were learning to play instruments before printed music was widely available. Uh, it used to be very, very expensive. So, for example, in the very early days of the keyboard, you would have been taught by just preluding on chords. So, for example, you play a C major chord. I don't know if the sound quality is, is, is good here, but has that on your yeah, sound quality? Sounds great. And then, and then you would just pl just play the chords, and then you might um, might change it, and then you might be taught that that was an F major chord, or maybe you'd be taught all your chords in root position. Um, but you'd be taught to prelude on your chords. 
and then you would be improvising and then maybe you'd learn to read a little bit of music as well. But it would be a very holistic thing. But since the advent of unbelievably prevalent sheet music, we've become very tied to the written note. And that also was because many composers would get upset if you weren't playing precisely what they wanted you to play. Mm -hmm. And I think the pendulum has just swung too far to the other direction. Mm. And and now it's now it's coming back again. It's interesting that uh the invention of the printing press obviously had a huge impact on most areas of society in a very positive way uh and enabled uh huge growth in all of our knowledge and everything. Uh but it's it's actually had in the long term it's had a negative impact from my perspective on music education for this precise reason because as soon as it came in everyone started teaching the written notes and we've really only just started coming back, it feels like that to me anyway, to where Bach was teaching and what Chopin was doing and what Liszt was famous for, which was arranging, improvising and composing. Um, Absolutely. Mm. It's, and I, I was having this chat with uh, Forrest Kinney, uh, who you may know in the United States yes. on a previous podcast. Yes, I know him. Yeah, and uh, and he's he's actually kind of doing a whole lot of research on this very topic at the moment. So, uh, yes, your thinking and mine, we're all very closely <laughs> aligned. Regardless Absolutely. of all of that, it's about you know how, how we now progress because we know that it's so important. So we're going to talk about some real strategies for teachers in a moment. But I'm interested, I, I find my students – have tended to fall into two camps quite often. They're either tend towards playing by ear and like love just listening and playing stuff or they're readers. And I find that it's quite hard to get the listeners reading music and the readers playing by ear. Do you, do you find that as well or is this a bit peculiar to me and my students? Um, no, I'm sure that's true across the board because it takes different neurological pathways and some are more naturally developed in some pupils than others. So for example, when you see music and then play it, you're using a whole different set of neurological pathways inside your brain than when you hear music and play it. I think I'm coming at it from just a slightly different angle in that what I think people want to do more than anything is to be able to sit down and play. Now that could involve playing a piece from memory, or it could involve knowing two chords, for example, as I played the other the other minute, here's the C chord, C, E, G. And then here is the F chord, but played in a comfortable proposition from the C chord. So that's C, F, A. Now, if you just alternate those two chords, three, four, one, two, and then improvise in a hand position and a five finger position here is G, A, C, D, E. And so on. You can imagine how that would go on and on and on. Now, am I really hearing that inside my head first? Not necessarily, but it's something that I know what to do with. Two alternating chords and a cool right hand five finger position. Mm. G, A, C, D, E, which is obviously less schoolroom sounding than C, D, E, F, G. (laughs) It's the what can you do on the piano without your books? That's really the angle I'm coming from. So that for your own self-respect and for your own creativity and for your own sheer fun, you can sit down at the piano and play. Then the ear development comes later uh, in the way that we're taught. So you do it first and then you learn to hear your way around it. Because I'm very much an eye finger person myself. That's my my approach. My ear has developed amazingly well, Mm. but I don't actually teach anybody totally by ear. I do aim to teach everybody a bit by ear, a lot by notation, and a bit by improvising. And I think that's that's a good balance that a lot of teachers would would strike. Uh, I think playing by ear is quite closely connected with with singing, uh, and that's another that's an area that I even neglected for many years. Getting my kids to sing. How important is singing for piano students? Okay, well, singing absolutely develops hearing, doesn't it? And I love it if you think about the word ear, e a r. And then hear, H-E-A-R, and then heart. We talk about playing by heart, (laughs) H-E-A-R-T. They're all very, very bound up together. And one of the things we do on the piano teacher's course is get people to sing the roots of the chords. So, for example, one, one. Five gone down to G and one back to C, while the rest of the class is singing. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, 
little lamb. So we're getting them to sing in two parts, chord roots and melody and swap over and and to put that into their own piano teaching to help children and adults hear the underlying harmony. Mm, so important. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, what about, and obviously developing onto more chords. Mm. Yeah, yeah. What about the students that really don't want to sing? Because a piano lesson is all about playing the piano, right? <laughs> I kind of get it, particularly yeah. for teenagers. I don't want to sing, particularly, if, you know, no. boys when the voices are changing, etc. <laughs> Um, interestingly, they'll hum, but but it's got to be approached so subtly, like you do it with them, and 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 they may join in. Particularly, I'm I'm really fierce on getting my students to count, so we we count and sing. Um, I'm just trying to think of a, a of a tune that everyone will know. Well, let's let's just take that Bach minuet that most of us play in in G major. Although now it's found to be by Christian Pretzold. And so <laughs> one, two, and three, and one, two, three. So I will sing and count with them. Oh right, okay. Um, and and they, they they then will find that as they're counting, their voices are tuned to the tune as well because I'm doing it with them. Hmm. Um, so they kind of attune to my my voice and attune to the notes that they're playing, and it's all done quite subtly. Um, I'm sure you find that, don't you? You have to sort of ease them into it. Yeah, you do, and make it very without them realizing what's happening. Yeah, and and do it a lot, kind of normalize it. I find if I if I take on a, a student now yes. and we just sing from lesson one, then it's like okay, this is just what we do. Whereas it is hard if you suddenly start yeah. doing a whole lot of singing. So um, that's what I would say to teachers: is uh, if you value and you feel that singing is important, which we all do, uh, try it from the beginning too. It's a great idea. Yeah. Interesting. I think this segues really well into another question I wanted to ask you, which was about exams. We both come from parts of the world where exams are prevalent. And uh, I don't know about you, but teachers, I know teachers often leave preparing the oral skills test till that last week or two before exams because I used to accompany lots of students and their teachers, so the violin teacher would tell me or ask me, could you do some oral tests with them? And, and I would think, well, uh, yeah, I can, but really this should be something that you've been doing all year round. Um, is that your, your thinking on that? Totally. And if you do include a little bit of playing by ear with them all year round, then you can incorporate the oral test. So, I mean, one of the reasons for teaching people to sing these chord roots is then that they play the chord roots. And then the more they play the chord roots, the more they're going to hear the different chords in their oral tests. So the way to train for oral tests, in my opinion, if you ask me, is to get them to play what it is they have to uh, learn to recognize. Mm, yeah, and that uh, recognizing bass lines, which uh, we have to do for the AMEB, I think the ABRSM asks for something similar, is is yeah. a real challenge unless they practice it a lot, and which is why I like exactly. using pop music and getting kids to sing and play bass lines from pop songs. Absolutely perfect. All right, so let's get into it. What are some of your favorite fun, relevant, practical activities for practicing oral and singing and listening skills rather than, you know, okay, let's sing a perfect fifth, everyone? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so one of them is is to improvise because if you are improvising in a in um, a limited hand position, even if it's um, C D E F G, you learn what your intervals sound like, and you can do exercises and and sing them a second, a second, a third, a third, a fourth, a fourth, a fifth, a fifth, and so on. So that is is one and then the the, the, the chord roots um most children i don't know about it, uh, when you're part of the world but over here we're still playing this oh yeah everyone loves that <laughs> okay so if if all your pupils know that it's one six four five and you can really build it up week by week by first of all teaching one and five and then the next week adding four or the next term depending upon their age and then finally adding six teach them the chords first then teach them the chord progressions and there are so many songs that have that chord progression and mm. as you know so many pop songs um, mm. and you just make them aware of their chord progressions and uh, they sing them and they play them yeah and i notice that you're you're singing as you're you're demonstrating at the moment and, and that's what you're saying we should be doing so rather than just playing yeah. sing as well and get kids to sing and play at the same time even yeah and sing to the the chord number of what you're doing so you you sing rather than c a minor f g although that's fine that's a good thing to do as well one six 
four, five. So the inner hearing becomes very associated with the word that you're using. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's a really approachable. It's a bit way. like um, so, so far. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually. Uh, we've we've had um, an episode about sulfur, <laughs> which will yes. uh, air last week. Uh, so everyone will be hopefully up with that and all those questions about does and movable this and whatnot. <laughs> so hopefully that's been helpful. Um, yes. I, uh, I, let, I. Let me ca- go on. Yeah. Okay. So what I'd say is, um, if if you're if you come from a tradition and you're teaching in a tradition where you, you use sulfur and you're very comfortable with sulfur, I do know loads of people who find it very helpful to develop. Um, pupils in a hearing. However, you might have a pupil who hasn't had all that background. And for those pupils, I just find it easier just to use the numbers. So a C major chord would be one, three, five. And a C minor chord would be one, and you say flat, three, five. And then even in, say, in A major, where we know there's a sharp, one, three, five, because three means the major third. And then one, flat, three, five. You're simply flattening the major third. Right. It's not necessarily a logical flat. Consistency of words to sing an interval really does help develop it in a hearing. So as I was saying, if, if you're not happy with um, so far, then do something just plainly logical and, and English right. like and, that. And stick to it. Yeah. yeah. Were you brought up as, as a student with sulfur yourself? Only a little bit. I had one general class teacher who would do it a little bit. Hmm. My uh, private teacher didn't use it and I was only introduced to it when I started teaching classroom music because uh, another another teacher was using it. Um, so, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I love talking about it with people because that Kadai approach obviously has many benefits, uh, but it's very hard to suddenly start using it. So I really like what you've just said that, you know, it's okay. You don't have to uh, as long as you're consistent with the words that you use. Yes, and that they understand that it's conceptual. It's not a literal flat, for example. It's mm. it's a it's a it's it's a lowered semitone or a raised semitone. Yes, you just got to find your own system. Yes, no, and plain English does me very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we've we've mentioned happy birthday in the title to this episode. How do you go about teaching happy birthday? Oh, it's such fun. Okay. So we sing. Let's do it. Um, let's do it in F major because that's the key. So we'd sing happy birthday to you. And uh, we'd write out the words and underline the strong syllables. So right. happy birth. That's a strong syllable. Birthday to you. That's a strong syllable. Happy birth. Another one. Day to you. And so on. Underline all the strong syllables because that's where the chords are going to be. Then you sing. Having learnt in F major that your the chords you're going to need are the F major chord, the B flat major chord, because uh, that's chord four, and chord five, your C chord. Of course, this would be easier to do in C major, but I'm just giving you the example mm-hmm. in F major because that's how most people sing it, the key most people sing it in. So then, then you learn those chords in the piano-friendly positions, F, A, C, F, B flat, D. E, B flat, C for your C7 chord. Mm -hmm. And then you sing happy birthday and just try out the chord on the strong beats. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And so on until Mm -hmm. you've got your chord progression right. Um, And then when you know your chord progression, you can play the chords in a waltz style, something like this. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tim. Happy birthday to you. And you really don't need to play the tune. Playing the tune is a great fiddle, but you do need to start with a drum roll oh, yes. on your starting note, starting note C. And for my older students, they find this enormously good fun because at these kind of happy birthday parties, by the time anyone gets to the piano and sings happy birthday, they've normally had a glass or two of wine. <laughs> and it's very easy. It's very easy just to remember the chord progression. And so th- I encourage everyone to play Happy Birthday with the chords only. And of course, the children love to do it. It's easier for them in C major, but it's quite hard for them to sing in C major. 
and so on. But just to play the chords, and um, I'm not sure how you teach pop songs, but I'm sure you find that many, many of your students find the right hand melody so syncopated that it's very difficult to play. And so if they just play the chords and they croon along to the tune with their friends, it's much, much, much easier. Yeah, it's been my approach in the last few years to just discourage teachers from trying to teach students pop rhythms because they are just so yes. difficult. So if, yeah. if a student really is against singing and they really want to play the tune, then I suggest that the teacher teaches the chords and the student just play and learns the notes of the melody and they just play it in time as they know it because they've heard it so many times. But that uh, the whole you know yep. counting one e and a two e and and trying to work out no just forget it too hard. Um, but I, I love I love the approach agree. of uh, of of singing. Uh, you know, it's again, it's it's another thing. If you can normalize it and do it more often in your lessons, then you'll be amazed at how many students can sing quite well. I've been very surprised by some of my students. They have great voices. Yes, lovely, lovely when they're encouraged. Mm. Yeah. Uh, now with that that happy birthday too. Have you found uh, students? struggle to hear which chord should work with which melody note as they sing and how do you approach totally. it? how do you help that so that's why we write the lyrics out and underline the strong um, beats first and then once you find the right chord for your underlined syllable then you write the chord number in so in that way because you're using pen and paper you can go very very slowly just building it up chord by chord Right. Okay. Yep. And do you go into teaching them about one, four, fives and cadences and things like that eventually? Totally. Oh, no, no, totally. Right from the beginning. Right. Okay. Right from the beginning. So, um, for example, the, the book Piano by Ear, half of the book is devoted to the primary chords and the first section only to chords one and five. Mm. Um, and so primary chords in the keys of C, F and G takes up half the book because once you've, once you've got that and once you've got the usual inversions, you're well on your way to having a grounding to hear the rest of your chords. The next thing we do is secondary chords. So that's chords two and six. And then the really fun thing to do, but which most people um, get stuck on and they know, is to realise that if, if the chord that you're looking for is not a primary chord and it's not a secondary chord, what it's very, very likely to be is dominant to tonic or chord five to one in a closely related key. And that's the thing to look for next. Right, yes. Uh, and just, just for people who might be not understanding primary and secondary chords, could you just give us a quick overview? Yeah, so uh, the, your primary chords. Well, let's go from the very beginning. Here's C major, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. So chord one is based on C, chord two is based on D, chord three on E, chord four, chord five, chord six, chord seven, chord eight. And the primary chords, the most important chords in any key, are chord one, C, E, G, chord four, F, A, C in C major, and chord five, G, B, D. Most, most um, folk tunes, um, most of our traditional melodies can be harmonized using just one, four, and five. And then the secondary chords are chord two and chord six. So one, four, and five are the primaries, and the secondaries are two and six and also three. Three, yeah, yeah. The relative minor chords, effectively. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm actually just flipping through your book right now, which you were very kind to send me uh, when you first released it, uh, which has been such a great resource, I have to say, even for someone like me who uh, knows chords and progressions and I'm quite comfortable improvising. As you say, it's a very sequenced order of introducing things. And that's what I really love about it. And that's why I know teachers, uh, I'm sure you've got lots of great feedback about it and we'll get more, I'm sure, in the future. Uh, It's just so well organized. And um, and that's what's really hard. Sometimes when it comes to, you know, we know we should teach students how to read a lead sheet, for example. But it's like, you know, always that question is, where do I actually start? And it's very easy to start too far in advance and the kids get frustrated because it's too hard. Um, Do you have an approach for when you introduce lead sheet type playing? Some I do have some students who come simply wanting to play the pop tunes and, and, and accompany their own singing. With those students, we just start straight away learning the chords, learning what the chord symbols mean. No, uh, do I have a particular approach? Um, first of all, I teach the major chords, then the minor chords, then the chords with added 
minor sevenths, um, then chords with added major sevenths, and then we just follow the chord symbols and we explain it as I explain it as, as, it as we go along. along. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it will go along quite well if you're, uh, for example, you start with something like Happy Birthday, and they're learning one, four, five. They know those chords, and if they learn them in a few other keys, then they can start reading lead sheets, particularly if they're already learning how to read music, notated music on this on the side too. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Now your book um, and Christmas. Also, a good most many people know Christmas carols, and and then the well known tunes, um, the, the heart and soul types of tunes. But as you say, any pop tune, pop tunes normally come along with with chord symbols, and, and if we turn those into Roman numerals, that, then they soon get the drift of the of the usual chord progressions. Yes, for example, pop tunes right. don't usually end on that don't usually begin on chord one. Pop tunes don't usually end on chord one, but. Yeah, that's just a, a, yeah, a whole lot of variety to explore. But unless students have this chordal knowledge, there's no way they can get their teeth into it. Uh, and so that's why, like you, I'm very passionate about giving students a grounding in chords as well as their ability to read. Uh, and so interestingly, your book, uh, start the first a third at least, is all quite improvisationary. Um, and so if teachers are interested in this book, it's called Piano by Ear, published by Faber Music. While it does involve lots of listening and singing, it actually is a book about improvising too, isn't it? It is, it is. And you are going to ask me about how and when I introduced the modes. And I find the modes are a wonderful way to improvise. I'm sure your listeners are mainly familiar with the modes, but if not, they're just scales that go from a white note to a white note. So C major is the Ionian mode. The white notes from D to D is the Dorian mode. One of my favorites is the white notes from A to A, which is the Aeolian mode. And if we just have a simple bass, two, three, here I'm playing A and then G and then F, two, three, and E, two, three, A, two, three. So a repeated bass, and then a five finger position from A to E. And it's so safe because nothing's going to sound wrong at mm. any point. Yeah, I love descending bass um, lines. Uh, <laughs> They're so good. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but, and you can build chords onto it. And a full scale. And so on. So there are loads of those in the book as well, mm. ideas for improvising. Begin, beginning in the modes, things aren't going to sound wrong, whereas as soon as you've got a major scale, that fourth note where there's a semitone between the third and the fourth note and the seventh note where there's a semitone between the seventh and the eighth note, these can sound very angular. And that's why, to begin with, um, I also recommend that people improvise in a pentatonic shape. So that would be C, D, E, missing out F, G and A. But that's very uncomfortable for the hand. First, second, third finger, big stretch, fourth finger, fifth finger. So rather than doing it that way around, play G, A, then have a big stretch between your second and third finger, C, D, E, G, A, C, D, E. Yeah, nice trick. Um, but definitely avoid the fourth and the seventh notes of the major scale. Yes, correct. Uh, I'm just having a look here too at your your introduction to the modes. Uh, and so, for example, Dorian mode has two pages here. You've got the notes, you've got chords that go with it uh, and songs that use it. Uh, which I think is great. So Scarborough Fair and What Shall We Do With The Drunken Sailor, they're my two go-to Dorian mode examples as well. Yes, um, yes. And then you've got yes. Mixolydian uh, and, you know, it's it does, as I say, step through things just so uh, so effectively. Um, so congratulations. Great resource for teachers. Well, thanks for all your resources too. I use them. Oh, no, <laughs> that's absolute pleasure. <laughs> uh, lovely to hear that it's helpful for uh, any teachers around the world, of course. Now, Absolutely. I think we'll, um, we'll start wrapping things up. Um, w I did want to mention, of course, you've got this book we've been talking about a little bit, but you've also got a number of live uh, workshops that you run. Firstly, the Piano Teachers course and also your own uh, summer course, which you must have just kind of finished, I guess, because summertime you've just finished, uh, had, haven't you? Um, can yeah. you tell us briefly about those two programs? Okay, so the Piano Teachers Course UK um, is a course I run with five other of the top British tutors, and we 
teach teachers to have a holistic approach. We completely understand that most teachers will come to us from a purely notation-based background, but everyone's dying to break out and be able to cater their pupils' interests and needs. So we teach a wide range of things from conventional interpretation, conventional and the best of it, conventional technique, to practice strategies, to playing by ear and improvising, to sing first, then play, and a whole wealth of uh, opportunities to practice performing, first of all, in duets and trios and then in solos. And we very much help teachers to key into their pupils through um, helping them observe their own teaching. Mm. So it's a very, very holistic and full on course. And it uh, helps guide teachers towards um, teaching diplomas or it just refreshes teachers who have already got their teaching diplomas and who've already got years of experience. Mm. Sorry, just on the yeah. piano teachers course, it's it's not just a five day course. It's over a course of months, isn't it? No, uh, the piano teachers course is a part time course that takes place over a whole year. It's fourteen days. Most of them are on residential weekends. Right. Yeah. Um, and right. there's assignments in between, and it's very recognised by our main exam boards here. And mm-hmm. uh, they recognise it as excellent uh, preparation for the for the teaching diplomas and excellent preparation to be a really good holistic pupil centred piano teacher. Mm. And I like that idea of spreading it out because teachers can get inspired, go and try things with their students, come back next time and talk about it with other people. They can improve their own practice so that their performance skills are more confident. Uh, I do. I think that's a great approach to take with a course like this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and, and the, the network of friendships is, is wonderful. Mm. Uh, and the, the, we find that the piano teaching profession as a whole is strengthened because so many people come together regularly yes, and discuss what they're doing. Yeah, uh, it's so meaningful and why I love, you know, get bringing people together uh, online as well. You know, it's 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 what we can do. We can't all, come, unfortunately, come and visit you guys in the UK. It's a long flight from here. <laughs> now tell us about your own course. It's a five-day course that happens in the summer. Um, it's called The Course to inspire and refresh music teaching learning and performing it's not just for piano players it's for um, instrumental and vocal teachers as well and we start off by doing psychology for teaching psychology for learning psychology for performing and this it's very practical psychology very holistic mind body spirit if you like and we uh, just move as a group and get into whatever people in the group wish to discuss um, and wish to talk about with their own teaching, their own performing, their own learning. Um, We involve playing by ear and improvising and uh, dance for musicians. Um, And it's in the centre of London right now. I've run it in a number of places, um, but right now it's back in the centre of London. So you have the chance to go to all those wonderful concerts in the evenings. And we have a long break in the afternoon where you can go and visit the London Eye or the Tate Modern or Houses of Parliament or Big Ben or whatever else it is you want to do while you're in London. Oh, fantastic. Yes, you used to run it in out in a country retreat, I think, from memory. Is that right? I did. I, yeah. I ran it by the sea in Wales in a in a, oh, wow. a, a town called Aberystwyth, yes. And that was enormously good fun. But many people found that it's such a long journey to get there. Yes. Uh, and as soon as I brought it back to London, the numbers increased simply, simply because it's, it's more viable for people. Mm. So uh, anyone who's interested in finding out more about Lucinda can head to her website, lucinda-macworth, M-A-C-K-W-O-R-T-H-young.co.uk. All your links to all your resources and books and uh, associated um, teaching ideas are all there, which is great. Before we wrap, maybe could you give us perhaps three tips that teachers, you'd like teachers to take away from this episode, things that they could do or a mindset that they should have? Okay, so when improvising, just have one fixed repeated bass. That could be two alternating chords, as illustrated, or it could be a four-note repeated bass. And begin uh, playing this bass for your pupil to improvise with their right hand in a five-finger position. So that could be uh, a G, A, C, D, E position or it could be an A, B, C, D, E position. The five finger minor sounds good. So that's kind of quite a lot of ideas. Secondly, start with a list of tunes that only need chords one and five, like Mary Had a Little Lamb or Peas Putting Heart to learn to, to play by ear, then move on to tunes which need three chords. And then I think the, the third and last thing is be really, really tuned in to your pupil and Go where they want to go. Do what they want to do. 
keep their courage and their motivation up, but then just gently be aware of what they're not doing and from time to time slip it in. So if they are only comfortable reading from notation, from time to time slip in a little improvisation in the key of the piece they're playing, something very simple like I've just described, or if they only want to play by ear and improvise, from time to time slip in the reading of a really well-known tune, a very simple one, and see if they can figure it out. So we've got to keep our mind around the holistic framework, but go with whatever it is that inspires the pupil at the time. Well, we're here, here. I thoroughly agree with all that you've just said. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's early morning over there, Lucinda. Really appreciate your time, given how busy you are as well. Thank you. And I will apologize to everyone for our few sound issues today. Uh, <laughs> it's obviously a long way over to, uh, to England from here in Australia, so we had some, had some fun with that. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next episode, uh, episode 111. And remember that you can actually get Facebook updates about all my new posts and uh, podcasts directly into your messenger. If you'd like to know how to do that, it's literally one click. If you head to timtopham.com slash Facebook, you'll be able to make that click and pop up uh, when I, uh, I'll pop up in your Facebook Messenger whenever a new episode comes up. And thanks finally to everyone who's left reviews on Facebook and iTunes. I really appreciate all your feedback. And if you would like to support the work I'm doing by leaving a review, I would really uh, love to read them. You can head to timtopham.com slash review to find out how to do it. Really simple process. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. We'll conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.